The decade was coming to a close. A decade of some of the most fresh and original movies from some of horror's greatest actors, writers, and directors. But hey, it can't be all great all the time, right? While the decade has had its fair share of original properties and one-off standouts, it also had a veritable Mount Rushmore of repeating recognizable faces, and 75% of that mountain was held up by Freddy, Jason, and Michael. I would assume that no last names are needed here with those heavy hitters. Those three killers put more work in from 1980 to 1989 than any other combo in any other decade. So who would have thought that they would contribute to the close of the decade going out with a confused whimper rather than a bloody bang? Today on 80s Horror Memories, we're going to examine three movies that came from some of horror's biggest franchise, all from 1989 and see why slam dunk franchises don't always produce slam dunk movies. What could I possibly say about uh, Michael Myers or Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees that hasn't been said ad nauseum, save the fact that they uh, hold a place in the horror pantheon for a reason, uh, because they've been a stalwart vanguard for what we as 80s film, uh, 80s film goers loved. July 28th, 1989. We were promised that Jason Voorhees would stab his way through the Big Apple and take Manhattan. But boy, were we sorely mistaken. Releasing just over a year after Part 7, Manhattan made money, but not nearly as much compared to its predecessors. The series had eight entries during the decade, which was by far the most out of the aforementioned Big Three. The movie acts as a sort of closing act to a Jason trilogy. No, not the Tommy Jarvis trilogy. You know, the better trilogy. The one I'm referring to is the supernatural Jason arc that was also toned down way too much to appease the MPAA. While part 6 embraces the silliness from the word go and its wonderful James Bond intro, and part 7 wanted to go full in on the full tilt psychic battle, part 8 loses its way and identity while also being just a toned down version of better entries. It had the highest budget of any Friday movie at that time of production, and had Paramount given the extra budget and gone with the original screenplay, we would have actually gotten a hell of a lot more of Jason taking the Big Apple by storm. The movie itself follows Jason being woken up from his watery grave by electricity, and then we simply follow him on his usual murder spree. He gets onto a cruise ship that is taking a graduating class into New York and the movie follows like they threw darts at a random board of people, places, and weapons to kill with. Think almost like a Clue version of Friday the 13th, which should have been a lot more fun. He dwindles down the characters one by one, then follows the survivors into New York City proper. It does try and keep a quasi-psychic thread going, with the main final girl, Rennie, seeing visions of Jason, both young and old. The final survivors ended up defeating Jason in toxic waste, and the movie ends without a stinger, and Paramount without a franchise. They sold the rights to New Line after, who gave it a go with three more sequels. Hey, at least Kane Hodder had a good time. Watched in a vacuum, the movie is fine, and a fun piece of 80s slasher canon, and maybe it's a Friday movie that speaks to you from time to time to throw on. Watch it in order in a marathon, though, and it adds nothing to the series at large. My friend Mark and I decided to run the series over the course of two days using the tube TV and VCR that he had in his garage. We had a blast through the first four, but day two definitely had its ups and downs. As we got closer to the end of the line, part 8 is objectively disappointing, and a sour way to end the run in the same way that this movie was a sour way to end the Voorhees run in the 80s. 
While Jason Takes Manhattan is the worst slasher sequel of 1989, it certainly wasn't the only one. We only had to fall asleep and look to our dreams, or nightmares rather, to see that. Releasing a month after his hockey mask companion and future fight partner, A Nightmare on Elm Street The Dream Child would give us the typical amazing poster, but fall short when it was released to theaters on August 11th, 1989. It made money, sure, with $22 million on an $8 million budget, but that was also the worst for the series up to that point, even if it was the highest grossing slasher of the year. The poster was made before the script was even finalized, so as cool as it looked, you had every right to be confused when you looked at it. The writers were too, apparently. The movie could have been very different for us too, as none other than Stephen King was approached to write and direct but unfortunately turned it down. Thorn cult aside, and boy will we get into that in a little bit, Freddy has always been the more outlandish killer of the three. Jason is overtly supernatural after the fourth movie, and Michael clearly comes back to life after every film. Freddy though? He is a ghost demon who attacks and kills you, often graphically and bizarrely in your dreams, and you never wake up. He is by far the most inherently frightening of the three, based on how he gets to you. As a kid, Halloween was the first series I started, and it still is my favorite. Friday the 13th is not scary, but works great as a series of popcorn slashers, and I always wanted to throw them on every now and then for a fun time. A Nightmare on Elm Street, though, was the first series that truly scared me. Part 3 in particular gave me, well, it gave me nightmares for a good bit. And even though Freddy would lean further and further into humorous territory, I still found him frightening. Robert England would again play Kruger, and his makeup was altered yet again. While not completely overhauled like in films past, it was made to give him an older appearance, and it looks pretty good throughout. Robert England's sans makeup appears in the movie during the scene where Kruger is conceived, and he had a great time with showing up and giving a little knowing wink to the audience. Dream Child follows some continuity from the previous one, similar to Part 4 opening with the survivors of Part 3. This time, however, Freddy is attempting to get his revenge and come back into the real world through the unborn child of Alice and Dan. From unleashing Freddy from within to Dream Warriors and Dream Masters, adding a Dream Child seems like the logical thing to do. What is interesting, especially for a slasher film in the late 80s, is the low body count. Would you believe that it's only three? Those three do their best to be memorable too, with Dan getting turned into a hybrid vehicle before it was cool, Greta being fed parts of herself, and Mark getting snipped up as a comic book character. But three? That's a light load even in a series that doesn't hold its hat on number of kills, and it's still the fewest in the franchise. It does keep in line with some of the more over-the-top moments of murder perpetrated by Freddy, but oh, we could have had so much more if not for the MPAA threatening an X rating at every turn. The movie wasn't popular then, and even though it has gained popularity in the 35 years since it has released, it is still seen as a miss for the franchise as a whole. Freddy being reborn, or the movie having to do with a baby, was attempted in scripts as early as part 2, but didn't come to fruition until part 5. While it's cool that they were able to finally work it into a film, the performance and overall opinion of this movie would spell the end of the series after the next entry, appropriately titled Freddy's Dead. And now, that's over. From one part five to another, 1989 would also see the release of Halloween 5 on, ironically, Friday, October 13th. Much like his other slasher contemporaries, this movie would not do well, and would be the least profitable in the Halloween series to date, with only $11 million at the box office on a $5 million budget. Also, like Nightmare 5, this is a direct sequel to Part 4, and follows survivors Jamie Lloyd and her foster sister Rachel trying to pick up the pieces after Michael attacks the town, going after his niece Jamie. 
Yes, much like the polarizing decision to make Laurie Strode related to Michael in part two, they keep the familial bloodline angle in this new set of films too. The movie was almost very different to what we got, with the old hermit in the beginning being a younger guy named Dr. Death. He even has a Frankenstein motif of him bringing Michael Myers back to life. This was filmed, along with a few other scrapped angles that can be seen online or in documentaries about the movie or series as a whole. Another big change was originally Michael and Jamie were both going to be the killers. Something that makes sense after part four had Jamie partially recreate the beginning of the first movie as the ending of that film. She kills her foster mother and Loomis fears that the cycle has started over, with her taking the mantle of the emotionless mass killer. But we got a page out of Jason's book and were handed a psychic link between Michael and Jamie. The movie had a lot of problems, unfortunately, with director Dominique Ossangerard seemingly angering everyone on set and ignoring safety protocols, or even movie logic for that matter. Donald Pleasance was unhappy with not only the direction of the film, but also with the direction that his character took in using Jamie to get Michael, and how crazy he had seemingly become. Much like the other two sequels of 1989, this movie ran into the biggest slasher of the 1980s, the MPAA. In the 80s, like we got a lot of great horror icons. Right, the, uh, Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger and Michael Myers. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious, and I hope to be proven wrong, but I'm not sure whether we can create those kinds of icons today in the culture as it exists, because the attention span is so ephemeral and all over the place, and there's so much bombardment of information, we're always looking for the newest and next best thing, as opposed to finding both comfort and interest in something that is a foundational thing, and seeing someone come back. I mean, even, we're not looking for uh, um, Mission Impossible because of Tom Cruise necessarily, we just wanna see the stunts. There's nothing about that character that is really, okay, whatever. You could put anybody in that role. That's why Bond is interchangeable. It's the stunts. But horror icons from the 80s, it's about the horror icon. You want to see that character doing what they do um, in, a, in a, either a new environment or in a new way, but you want to see them. I'm not sure whether we can do that again. I hope we can. I hope we can find a way to have it. Because the moment you try to create a horror icon, just that thought, you've already failed. You've literally already failed because you're not coming fa you're not coming into the room through the right door. You have to come through the story and the character and the reason for them to exist, and then they have to earn the right to be a member of that pantheon. And, uh, what, what, what would you say the last character that's entered that pantheon would be? Like, I can't think of one that I'm like, yeah. See, the fact that we're all going. Wah. Despite the changes to both Loomis and Jamie's characters. The biggest shift and weirdest part of the movie is the introduction of the man in black, which leads to the thorn cult angle of the next movie. It's a plot point that comes out of nowhere and bookends the typical walking speed kill spree with the opening that forgets the implications of the end of the preceding film. For all of the grief that this film gets, and if I had to guess, I'd have no doubt in my head that it's the least favorite of most people amongst the three. I have quite the soft spot for this movie. I actually bought this from Blockbuster Music, sight unseen on VHS with my own money in the late 90s. I had worked my way through the series to that point and had just recently returned my rental of part four to trusty old Video Unlimited. I watched it, didn't love it, but it was mine and the first horror movie I ever paid for myself and would watch it all the time, regardless of how much I actually enjoyed it. While the three franchises had also released movies the year prior in 1988, those all performed well, or at least better than doing the same strategy did in 1989. None of these are without merit to watch, and all have entertainment value to them. But it was hard to watch our three icons push their series, and the 80s as a whole, out with a whimper rather than a bloody bang. The three stalkers would all come back in the 90s and beyond with varying degrees of enjoyment and success, but here they will be forever filed under the bad horror sequels of 1989. 
So IP, intellectual property. Why so many sequels? Because marketing is so expensive to penetrate the din out there that's trying to get your entertainment time and dollar. So that's why you see all these movies because people think, like I don't want to see a movie about a Magic 8-Ball, but people think, oh, people know what Magic 8-Ball is. We've just cut out $10 million of getting people to understand what this movie is. I don't necessarily think that's true. And I think that with Ari Aster and a bunch of other filmmakers, you're starting to see that the fresh and original takes are the ones that people are gravitating towards because there's mystery behind them. There's, oh, that's a premise I haven't even heard about. It doesn't have to be associated with like Magic Viewfinder. It's like, this is something interesting that's unique and it's about a human trauma or condition. It's something accessible that we can understand as people, not as things or as consumers. And I think that's hopefully, hopefully where we're heading, where it's no longer about uh, easily identified characters that we had from our childhood, but it's about characters that we as a collective have created so that our children have things that they find culturally specific to them that they want to carry to the future. That's our job as storytellers now, is to give the younger generation what we got from the 80s, which is all the icons that matter to us and that we've been carrying the ball. It's time to hand the baton, not with something old, but let's give them something new. On the next episode, grab a machete or whatever your stabbing implement of choice is and take a walk down memory lane as we take a look at the legacy of Tom Savini. Until next time, gore hounds. Hi friends, your humble narrator Tyler Nichols here, and I hope that you enjoyed that episode of 80s Horror Memories. If you missed our previous episode, click over here. If you want to see more from our series, click up here. And if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? Subscribe right here. And most importantly, stay spooky, folks.